Uh, my name is Salma Alam Naila. I had to double barrel my name when I got married, otherwise it would have been a disease. And this is entertainment as code. <laughs> That's where you clap. <laughs> Thank you. I, I write code for your entertainment. I'm a live streamer on Twitch, a software engineer, and developer educator. I got COVID for the first time a few weeks ago, and I hadn't even started writing this talk. And I change my hair all the time. This haircut is six years old. Still not sure about it. Let's travel back to 2008, when I graduated from the Royal Northern College in Music, uh, Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester with a degree in composition. I wanted to be a film composer for your entertainment. And at the time, I was also in a folk band. We released an album, played weddings and festivals for your entertainment. And I was also making terrible websites, graphics, and album art for my musician friends. But as a musician, in order to pay the bills, you usually end up being a teacher. My name's Salma, I'm one of the lead tutors here at the School of Rock and Pop. The School of Rock and Pop combines professional music tuition with the opportunity to perform. Each centre holds two gigs uh, at recognised rock music venues. It's a chance to meet like-minded teenagers and really rock out in a way that can't be done at home. <clears throat> I actually started learning the drums properly like eight weeks ago. It's a lot of fun. Didn't know how to play the drums then. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, in 2010, I set up the School of Rock and Pop in Manchester, and I was teaching children how to be in rock bands for your entertainment. And it was about helping them put music into a real tangible context rather than practicing alone in their rooms. And I really liked this whole teaching thing. So I got a teaching qualification and I worked as a music teacher in secondary schools and sixth forms for a few years. Around this time, I was also a musical comedian for your entertainment. We played some good gigs, won some competitions, and we, didn't, we, we, we went viral on the internet a few times. Unfortunately, you can't watch our music videos now because unlike HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, some comedy is not evergreen. <laughs> what is funny, though, is that whenever I'm on stage with a mic, I instinctively try to tell jokes and need to like stop myself. Um, I am not going to tell any jokes today. But I do just want to take a brief intermission and talk about a new business venture that I'm working on. Now I'm on the stage. Now, because I've got your attention, I love tech, as I'm sure all of you do here. And breakfast <laughs> is the most important meal of the day. I'm, you all love breakfast more than tech. So I, I want to merge the two and open a tech-themed breakfast and brunch bar. Tech-themed breakfast and brunch bar called Tech First, obviously. And there'll be things on the menu like full stack of pancakes. Eggs and Jason. <laughs> Pop three tarts. Chat GPT. Yeah. Infrastructure as toast. And serial numbers. And it'll all be served in little containers as micro servings. And the service will be blazing fast. And if there are any investors in the audience today, I am trying to raise the chia seed round right now. So please talk to me later at the social. No more jokes. It's time to be serious, Salma, which is um, often the feedback I get on my PRs. <laughs> no more jokes. Let's fast forward to 2014 when I quit teaching and I got my first job in tech. I don't have the time to tell the full story today. Uh, it's on my YouTube channel if you are interested, but this led to many more jobs in tech. As a front-end developer and a tech lead at product agencies, startups, global e-commerce brands, you know, boring, boring, same old. 
But in 2020, as a lot of uh, other people have alluded today, everything changed. The pandemic descended, everyone stayed inside, and we all found new ways to spend our time. And here's where Twitch comes into my life. The main focus and the largest categories on live streaming platform Twitch have always been centered around gaming, but as time went on, creators started streaming music, arts and crafts, talk shows, charity events, 24 seven live feeds of farm animals, anything you could probably ever dream of. That wasn't a joke. And in 2020, for a short time, I was also glued to a behind-the-counter live stream of the comings and goings of a fish and chip shop. I think it might have been in Brighton, but I'm not sure. I'm probably making that up. Twitch ended 2020 with its biggest numbers ever. 17 billion hours were spent on Twitch in 2020, which was 83% higher than in 2019. And I was part of that. I started watching Twitch in the first lockdown of 2020, and the category that caught my attention was software and game development. People were writing code live on stream, and people were watching. It sounds like madness. <laughs> in the last year, over 14 million hours of software and game development streams have been watched. The category has around 1.6K average viewers at any one time, and there are always around 100 live software and game dev channels at any one time. Now, it is a small category compared to gaming, but with that comes a big opportunity. On Thursday, the 25th of June, 2020, I went live on Twitch for the first time. Under the username White Panther, I don't have time to tell the story about this username, but so come and ask me later if you are interested. Uh, it didn't make sense, but it was quite unintentional that Panthers would become integral to everything, and you'll see later. Now, here is the earliest stream clip I have. It's not the first, but it's very early. So now Standard and Drop D is working, but Dadgad is not. <laughs> Typical stream, right? Typical development. Everything goes wrong all the time. In this clip, I was building my first open source app called the Fretinator. No, it's, it's true. That's not a joke. It exists now. You can go to see it. Um, the Fretinator. And I was having problems. People in the chat were helping me. Now, the Fretinator is a guitar app to uh, help you learn scales and modes, and you can use it in the browser. So why did I do this, first of all, other than boredom and Boris not letting me out? The channels I saw were mainly uh, back-end development, you know, C-sharp, Rust, boring stuff. And um, they were also being streamed by mainly men, so I thought maybe I could fill a gap in the market. I am not a man, and I'm a front-end developer. That's my specialism. And also, I started building the Fretinator a few months before um, because I wanted to learn Angular. And I learn best by building stuff and putting things into like real context. I was also building this app for my husband. He wanted to learn scale and mode theory on the guitar, but my traditional music teaching methods were failing him. And he desired a way to learn interactively on his own. So I'll show you what I was building. It's real. It does exist. Uh, you choose a starting note. You pick a mode that you want to learn and use the guitar fretboard to learn the scale. It does play sound and use the web audio API as well. And you can dive deeper into the theory of modes and scales if you want. But most importantly, every scale for every note comes with a backing track for you to practice with. 160 jam tracks for every note and scale combination were painstakingly manually sourced, not using ChatGPT, for your entertainment. So the Fretinator is about, rather than just playing the scale on your own without any more musical context, it's about putting the theory into practice in tangible and meaningful ways, much like the mission of the School of Rock and Pop. And this concept of putting theory into practice, of making tangible things, has underpinned everything I do in tech and on my stream for your entertainment. 
My original cheesy tagline, build stuff, learn things, love what you do, yes. Um, put the focus on building, um, which is representative of how I learn. I actually retired this tagline this year because I had the realization that it was too similar to live, laugh, love. <laughs> <clears throat> you can still buy this, though, if you want to enjoy living, laughing, loving. But through streaming on Twitch during the pandemic, I was starting to discover that demonstrating and practically applying technical concepts in front of a live audience was making tech more accessible. It was making it more human, pretty much exactly like when you perform music with others. It was also, at times, like pair programming with 100 people all at once. But you know how like camaraderie developments through tough experiences, and especially through the inevitable pain and suffering of software development, like this. I quit. I, I just qu I quit. I quit. I'm going to do something else. I can't, I can't make this. Every step of the way is just an absolute piece of shit. <laughs> I think that, um, so the documentation was telling me that I needed to provision an SSL certificate in order to make an API call on my local machine. And I was just done. Uh, but when you've problem solved as a team with you and the viewers, and your code finally works, you feel good, right? Those brain chemicals, they bring you closer to, they form uh, those human relationships even more. If it does work, I will feel sick that I have succeeded. Ah! <laughs> Look! Ah, I did it! I did it! <laughs> so as I was working out what this whole streaming thing was about, people were coming, they were watching me, they were helping me, and they were returning back to my stream days later to see progress. They were pair programming with me, and they wanted to see me succeed. So without even setting out to do this, there was a community forming around me and my stream. And in just seven days from that first day that I went live, I'd streamed enough and had enough average concurrent viewers to gain affiliate status on Twitch, which meant I could make use of community engagement tools, such as custom emotes, there are those Panthers, VIP status for viewers, channel point redemptions, and people could throw Twitch currency at me, currency at me in the form of subs and cheers. So I wrote about what I learned in those early days on my blog. And the most important thing I took away from this is that the most valuable element to your stream, whatever you stream, is you. The code you are writing is only a small part of the experience. Viewers don't actually watch you to learn how to code. That's just a side effect. They come to hang out with you, to feel safe in the presence of people with similar interests, and to be entertained. Now, I haven't rehearsed this slide because I added it after a conversation with Maggie at lunch. Um, <clears throat> but in the before times, right, um, before there was software and game development, the one category that uh, programmers streamed in was science and technology. And um, science and te technology became overrun with 24-7 live feeds of farm animals and earthquake detectors and just nonsense. And so we raised an issue on Twitch user voice for a particular category for us, software and game development. And it was going well, and we were really looking forward to the new category launch, but Twitch decided to release a new category before our category, which was hot tubs, pools, and beaches. It was it's basically a soft porn category um, designed to take away all the people who want to sit in a hot tub um, from just chatting and to put them in their own category. Um, presumably it was to hide them, but they're just more easily discoverable now. Um, but the, the, the core theme of hot tubs, pools and beaches is that people follow or sub or donate in order to get their name written on uh, the streamer's body. So they can feel like they are part of something. They are closer to the streamer and they um, are in the stream. Now, hot tubs, pools and beaches became a meme in the programming 
community, uh, people started just putting pictures of hot tubs on, on their stream overlays and writing their names of followers on their faces. But the conclusion to all of this is that deep down at the root of everything, everyone just wants to be part of a stream on Twitch. Whether it's getting your name written on someone's leg or having your avatar and username rain down on the stream in an exciting way, everyone wants to be part of it. And this is going to become a running theme uh, later on. So I didn't start streaming from a hot tub, but the community was forming around me. And to support that, I created the Claw Discord on the 30th of July, 2020. Apparently, a claw is a group of panthers, but I've only seen it referenced once. So I don't know whether I got that wrong. But people started gathering here when I was offline. Relationships started to form, and now we even have a co-working channel where remote workers from around the world, they log into the channel, they have their uh, cameras on, and they just keep each other company while they're working from their bedrooms all day, and it's pretty nice to see. So Twitch viewers, they're, they're not passive like YouTube viewers. They are active participants in the experience. And so I started thinking about how I could build on this and how I could bring people further into the stream to make them feel even more involved with what they were experiencing without having to write their name on my face. <clears throat> so I built a Twitch bot. And this is an application built using the Twitch API and other third-party tools to allow viewers to make things happen on the screen via chat commands and channel point redemptions to level up their participation in the stream. There are pre-existing tools that exist to bring interactivity to your streams if you can't build your own, such as Nightbot that I use as well. And making a Twitch bot is not a new and innovative thing. Lots of programming streamers have done this. But here, I had the opportunity to build a Twitch bot that reflected my personality and the entertainment value of the stream that I wanted to build on. Plus, building stuff for your stream, live on stream, with viewers, for viewers is the best way to test functionality, get the QA going, crowdsource ideas, and again, make people feel part of that process, part of the product, and part of the stream. Here is some probably very over-engineered architecture for your entertainment. This is everything I use to currently power my stream interactions and everything that happens. We start with PantherBot, which is an express app. It uses TypeScript. It stores some stuff in MongoDB, and it sends events over a WebSocket connection. It's the back end. It sends events back and forth um, using the Twitch API and also a third-party wrapper around the Twitch API called TMIJS. We have two React apps, two front ends that are listening for WebSocket events. There's a types package that both the back end and front end applications use. It also uses the Discord API. And all of this is brought together in OBS, which stands for Open Broadcaster Software, which I use to stream, where each piece of functionality is added to my stream scenes as what we call browser source URL. So if you can get a, a browser URL in the browser that does some stuff, you can easily put that into OBS so it can do the stuff there. I also use another tool called Atom, which is um, a, a desktop app that allows me to control OBS itself via Twitch stuff. So that's it, and I've been building this over three years. Um, so I want to show you some of the key functionality of my Twitch bot. The whole thing did used to be open source, but it got too bespoke. Far too silly. So it is private, but luckily I have some core maintainers in my community who help me out with bugs and features and general fun stuff. So follows, subscriptions, and cheering are core parts of the Twitch experience. And as a viewer myself, I like to sneak into other viewers' streams um, and follow streamers just to see how much I become part of the stream when I press the follow button. If nothing happens and the streamer doesn't notice me, I'll usually just bounce right out. Because as we know, making your viewers feel welcome and part of something is key to getting them to stick around, especially in this smaller, more intimate category of software and game development. So here's how my alert started out. Okay, pew, W-T-E-D. Thanks for the follow, pew, pew. I need like a pew, pew panther, pew, pew. So that was using uh, Streamlabs Alerts, another free streamer tool, um, added as a browser source to OBS. I did make a pew pew panther, 
and I think it made Pew WTD feel very special. It's actually my most used emote, but I think it's because my bot um, uses that emote the most. <clears throat> the bot uses the event sub API from Twitch, which lets your application subscribe to events that happen on Twitch. So when an event occurs for one of my subscriptions, such as a follow, Twitch sends my app a notification. So here's what happens when I receive a follow event. In order to protect against viewers spamming the alerts on my stream, which yes, people do try and do this, we first check for an existing follower in the database. If we don't find one, we find the Twitch user. I've just got like a wrapper around the Twitch API here. And send a follow event over the WebSocket connection. Most importantly, the event contains the follower name and their profile image, which is how we'll put the viewer into the stream. So there's a number of front end URLs which are listening for WebSocket events from the back end. Here is a little React component that powers all the alerts. There's a queuing system, because we want to account for lots of things happening at once, especially with a substantial amount of viewers. And each type of alert shows a different image and subtitle depending on what's sent. Each alert also plays a different alert sound, which both me and the viewer hear when I'm streaming. All sounds are custom sounds written and recorded by me and my husband. And I do have a funny story about custom sounds. When the repo was open source, I stored the MP3 files for alerts in my Google Drive, and I used environment variables to access them when needed so people couldn't steal the files from the open source repo. At random times, the alert sounds would just stop working. And it took me and my viewers months to work out why. And it turns out that too many alerts any one time would DDoS the connection to Google Drive and deny the bot access. So um, my Twitch viewers DDoSed Google. So that was fun. Um, right now, my uh, follow alerts look like this. I'm on dear um, Thank you for the follow. Welcome. This is also when I accidentally colored my hair to match uh, my stream background. Total accident, and I am yearning for that one now. <clears throat> also notice two other events that happened. Uh, one that changes the Panther logo overlaid on my camera at random, and one that rains down my Twitch emotes, um, all on separate browser sources in OBS, um, listening to WebSocket events from the back end. And as you watch a stream, you accumulate channel currency, and you can choose to spend that currency on fun stuff set up by the streamer. So I enable viewers to trigger the logo change manually via channel point redemptions whenever they want. It also uh, triggers a sound per panther. And uh, viewers can also trigger the emote rain via a variety of different weather commands, such as rain, hail, snow, blizzard, just by writing in chat. And it's gone through a lot of iterations throughout the years, including needing to limit the amount of emotes that were dropped at any one time, because this was just ridiculous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, rip my frame rate. Uh, that happened when someone decided to spend stupid money uh, on 50 gift subscriptions to my channel all at once. It broke everything, it just kept coming, and yes, we heard that guitar riff 50 times. <laughs> but that's entertainment. Uh, the act of writing code to make that happen live on Twitch was entertainment. Viewers being able to make things happen on my stream from anywhere in the world is entertainment. And what sometimes happens unexpectedly as a result of writing that code is also entertainment. So you probably also noticed in my stream clips that I show chat messages on stream. Chat is another custom browser overlay powered by the central Twitch bot, which listens to message events from TMIJS and sends events over the WebSocket connection, extremely over-engineered. A lot of information is sent over the WebSocket to power the chat messages, including VIP moderator subscriber status, and viewers have been very eager to act as QA for chat and suggest ideas for new features, such as allowing the use of a marquee tag, which is an undocumented Easter egg, and Numeronym mode, which is a channel point redemption. 
And it always makes new people to my stream uh, tell me that chat is broken and I have bugs when I have no bugs whatsoever. Uh, a numeronym, if you don't know, is a number-based word. Numeronyms are commonly used in tech to shorten long words, such as accessibility, internationalization, localization, Kubernetes, etc. And here is the code for numeronym mode. The make numeronym function splits the full message by space, and for each word, it returns the first character, the count of the characters in the middle, and the last character. And for some reason, I published this to NPM so I could use it in multiple places, and people are downloading it. Why? So that's fun, because uh, I've never used it in any other projects, but go off. Um, I also built a giveaway mechanism into my Twitch bot, live on stream, of course. Uh, giveaways are powered by typing commands in Twitch chat, such as start GA, that's how I start a giveaway, and to enter, viewers type exclamation mark win in chat. TMIJS listens to chat, to find possible commands that the application knows about. And if a command is found, then we run the handler for that command. If TMIJS reads exclamation mark win in chat and a giveaway is in progress, we enter the viewer into the giveaway. And then to draw, I type exclamation mark draw GA in chat, and a random winner is selected from entrants who are still present in the chat. And then we send the event over the WebSocket to the browser source overlays listening in OBS, and again, the key thing here is to send the user's profile image URL over the WebSocket to put them in the stream. Here is a clip of the giveaway in action. I like giving away things. Mo gets a t-shirt. And someone else gets a t-shirt today. <laughs> Congratulations. Well done. I seriously just like did something to my back. <laughs> uh, right, um, so I've given away things like uh, stickers, <laughs> merchandise, JetBrine's licenses, FFConf t-shirts, the postage costs for sending things to people around the world. Um, I've got like a bit much, so I haven't given away much recently. Uh, and it's very difficult and very non-inclusive to say UK people only, so, but it's fun, lots of fun, and I got to build some cool stuff. Backseating has always been a thing. It's kind of like a meme now. Um, new viewers often come into the stream and they just tell me what to do with no context about the problem we're solving, and it's the worst thing ever, like backseat driving. Why aren't you doing this? I think you should use this. Blah, 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 back seating. So one of my viewers thought it would be a good idea to put back seaters in a literal car. And while I was streaming, sent me these very lo-fi, three drawn layers of a car that I added to the scene in OBS on the fly. Layer in front of me. <laughs> the car has evolved, of course, and is now a permanent fixture in my stream and can be triggered by viewers. One second. Um, two Taco Bells, please. <laughs> uh, with sparkling water. Thank you. I've never had Taco Bell in my life. <laughs> I don't know what it tastes like. Oh, but sparkling water is the superior water. Here's how the car works. Again, TMIJS listens for a command in chat. Exclamation mark BS. What BS stands for here is open to interpretation. And uh, we grab the username from the message and we only put people in the back seat who are actually registered as viewing the stream. Otherwise, that would be rude. And then we send the event over the WebSocket again making sure to send the profile image URL. Now, the point of the car now is to be as offensively obtrusive as possible, like backseaters. And it looks like this. Welcome to the back. Get oh, off. Hey there. <laughs> <laughs> there's all sorts of magic involved. There's like Atom that does some text-to-speech and welcomes the user to the back seat. There's some filter changing and some stuff. Uh, I mean, it's probably going to get worse. So now I want to show you some other silly things I've built on stream that are not like part of my stream and how it brought people together 
what we learned along the way and just how much fun it was. GeoCities is something that is, yes, big up GeoCities, something that's so close to my heart. The original website builder of the 90s. And in GCSE IT, while people were making spreadsheets and text documents, I was making websites with GeoCities. I don't know how I got away with it, to be honest. Um, this is the first homepage of GeoCities from 22nd of October 1996. Left aligned content, Times New Roman, internet blue links, full of GIFs. There's a broken one as well. And table based layouts. Isn't that beautiful? Um, the semantic HTML in there is like pretty wild. There's description list and description term, but it's not followed by a description definition. So I'm very disappointed in GeoCities right there. I'm going to call them out on Twitter. <clears throat> this is the Style Stage project. Style Stage, uh, we've already had Stephanie Eccles mentioned today, also maintained by Stephanie Eccles, and it's about showcasing the capabilities of modern CSS. Now, your challenge with Style Stage, style, I can never say it, Style Stage, is to completely change the look and feel of this HTML page with CSS only. So it forces you to be really creative and learn more about CSS in the process. So I wanted to make Style Stage look like a GeoCities website. There's a lot going on here, isn't there? You can, right, if you've got internet, you can scan the QR code to, to go to this. Um, it's responsive, right? And I know that's not authentic, but I couldn't not make it responsive. Now, I do know what you're thinking. Salma, how did you pull off getting those iconic dancing baby GIFs in there without editing the HTML? Well, I'm glad you asked. Base64 <laughs> encoded data URLs added as pseudo elements to existing HTML elements on the page and assigned to CSS custom properties to be able to use those data URLs easily. Because those strings are very long. Like It was a complete like, nightmare, that CSS file, because there was obviously more than one like, I've done of this, isn't there? The fake visitor counter is also powered by a CSS animated pseudo element attached to the uh, H2 above it. And yes, I did manually specify 100 keyframes live on stream, much of the frustration of my viewers as they were forced to watch me do it. <laughs> I do what I want. Other highlights include this stunning marquee using the papyrus font added via another convoluted pseudo element powered by a CSS animation using transform translate purposefully breaking all of Ira's rules here, very, very sorry, uh, but it's all in the name of entertainment. Um, and these globes, uh, which are powered by the CSS list style property and a custom property of a data URL of another base64 encoded GIF. But I learned loads about CSS and how you can like stretch the possibilities. And me and my Twitch viewers all bonded over our love for the web of yesterday. Speaking of 90s internet nostalgia, I made a web ring. Now, a web ring is a collection of websites linked together in a circular structure, usually organized around a specific theme, such as technology. They were popular in the 90s and early 2000s, particularly among amateur websites, so all of our websites in here. <laughs> if you were a member of a web ring, you'd display that on your website. So the aim uh, of the Claw web ring and the widget and the infrastructure was to be, uh, make it as easy as possible to display the web ring widget on any website built with any or no framework. And I wanted to make sure that updates, for example, when new members join the ring, would be automatically pushed out to all sites without a redeploy. So what you see here is a web component. And clicking join takes you to the GitHub repo. You can navigate back and forth between the ring, and you can click to go to a random site in the ring. To add yourself to the web ring, you open a PR to the Claw web ring repo and add an entry to the members.json file with your name and site URL. After the original release, I had 26 more people add themselves to the web ring. And for some people, this was their first open source contribution. When your PR is merged, this will make your site data available 
on a public URL, which is fetched by the web component at runtime, which means that every instance on every site of the web component stays up to date. To show the web ring widget on your site, add the following script tag and custom element, custom element tag. And you can include some optional fallback content in case JavaScript isn't available, or you don't want to use JavaScript at all, which looks like this, progressive enhancement. Um, and you can configure light and dark mode, whether or not to show the full scrollable member list. And there's also a hidden Easter egg, of course. It just disappears. Why not? <clears throat> so that's the web ring. And now, for the biggest meme of my streaming career, I built a random code generator, and it was the funniest thing I did on stream. Now, this probably won't be funny today. And it's, I think it's like a kind of you had to be there kind of thing. But we'll give it a try. Um, this is the random code generator. So say I need some JavaScript for my project. I select the options, I scroll down, and bam, perfect JavaScript for me to copy and paste into my project. <laughs> it's perfect. This is how it started. <laughs> Quality memes. <laughs> Chat's loving it. That, that, that lump fowls are there and, and stuff. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I need to write more code. <laughs> so how does this work? Don't even know anymore. Um, but here's the JavaScript example. It's a bunch of methods that return a random thing. Some methods return an array, which will be processed by a helper function to return a random value from that array. Some methods mash together values returned from helper functions. So here are some fun helper functions. Get random noun, get random verb, get random single character, which was often used for uh, nonsense variable assignments. Um, and here are the verbs and nouns arrays. So when the random code is generated, we'll always start with a function name, which mashes a verb and noun together. So for example, initialize array, and then we can go through all of them. It's, that's what writing code is, right? And it goes on pretty much like that. Like, this is the full, I mean, it's not the full. I mean, there are millions lines of this, but I'm not going to explain this. It's stupid. But if you want to generate some random code, maybe show it on your website, like what I'm coding right now, similar to what I'm listening to right now on Spotify. You can, because I published it to NPM. <laughs> Again, no idea why people are downloading this. What are you doing with it? There were 105 downloads in a week in September. But this was actually the first package I published to NPM live on stream, of course, and I wrote about it. And the blog post was really popular. And if you search for build, test, release node module on Google, it's the top result with a featured snippet, which is like one of my biggest achievements that came out of writing stupid, pointless, silly, nonsense code in front of a live audience on Twitch. So it doesn't really matter what you do. Uh, the algorithm will decide. <laughs> uh, this led me to publish a few other nonsense, get random NPM modules. And I did start building a random website generator with get random headline and get random tech business name but it wasn't funny enough. I also received 75 pull requests to the original random code generator site before I turned it in a, into an NPM module. People loved adding their own favorite programming language to the catalog of random code generators. And again, for some people, it was their first contribution to open source. I'm warning you now, I am going over, but I will not go over the time I am allotted in the schedule. I've got plenty of time. Um, in August 2021, I achieved Twitch partner status. I had streamed enough in 30 days and gained enough average viewers to be given the prestigious checkmark badge next to my username. And to be honest, it's not that special. There are many, many Twitch partners these days. But being a Twitch partner meant I could form an official stream team on Twitch, bring the community closer together, the claw. We're currently at 28 members across multiple time zones, all streaming software and game development in a variety of formats and programming languages who are welcoming and inclusive to all. And yes, I need to update the Live, Laugh, Love banner on the top of that page. But of course, I use this opportunity to add some more functionality to my Twitch bot, including go live announcements in Discord, which is powered by Pantherbot and the Twitch event sub API 
So when a stream team member goes live, an announcement is posted to Discord, alerting all members who have opted in to the go live announcement rule, bringing everyone closer together. We're not far now. For a few more miscellaneous examples, I want to show you some smaller projects. So last year, I discovered a streaming channel called Zengo Web. They're a development agency in Hungary, live streaming their workday from the office. It's great to have one in the background. There's a co-working vibe. But it was difficult to remember their Twitch usernames and who was who in the office. So I decided to build something for them, another browser overlay for OBS to display each person's Twitch username on the stream. Here's the moment when it first went live. Yay! It works, it works, it works, it works. Look, there's a house. <laughs> All right, great. So how does it work? It's a plain HTML page hosted on Netlify. And in order to give the Zengo web team some control of the overlay without needing to edit the code, it also uses a Netlify edge function, which is a serverless function that runs at the closest server location to the request. And this enables Zengo web to use a URL query parameter to show team members as working from home whenever they need to. This works by intercepting the HTTP request for the index page, parsing the also has a tradition of eating pancakes. So there's also some client-side JS that runs on page load that assigns a random team member a pancake emoji. So they know it's their turn to make, purchase, or source pancakes. And it was Piptor's turn that day. Uh, the team have also submitted uh, quite a few PRs for new themes and improvements. So I was excited to merge them all. I've also experimented with creating some fun educational resources. One example of this is Game of Codes. It's an HTTP status code quiz, and I think it might be a good game for you, Amber. Here is a QR code if you have the internet and you want to play along right now. We'll save it for later. But here's a very sped up video of me completing the quiz. I did it in one take. I didn't like try to think too hard or do it over and over again to get 10 out of 10. This is my current HTTP knowledge. Um, when the quiz is complete, it gives you a summary of what you got right and what you got wrong, correct answers so you can learn and try again. Game of Codes is written in plain JavaScript. And uh, with Game of Codes, I also wanted to show what's possible without JavaScript, um, without a JavaScript framework or any dependencies. So instead of using a state management library, we're using a good old uh, JavaScript object to keep track of the game state. And the whole thing is written with a functional programming approach, so it's easily testable. There are no tests. And you might think, oh, this is easy. Salma has used plain JavaScript. The HTML must have an identifier for the correct answer, so the JavaScript knows which one I've selected to determine the outcome. So I can just do a little cheeky inspect the DOM, find the correct answer, and get 10 out of 10 every time. Surely Salma hasn't thought about that. Surely I can game the system. I did think about that, of course. Each answer generated is given a string of random numbers to identify it by. One of them's correct. The game state knows which one, but there's no other way to know in the HTML. Now, you could probably use the browser debugger, right? But then you'd be a, like, mega nerd. <laughs> I did have bigger plans for this, including uh, authentication via GitHub, a leaderboard, competitions. But at this point, I was also learning that some projects don't really need to be finished and can exist just as they are. I'm almost finished, I promise. We, as well as sharing my love for GeoCities, I've been sharing my love for the most enchanting, intriguing website of all time. I've been recreating a website that has been burned into my brain since I first encountered it in 1999. And it's a website that doesn't exist anymore. It's called hell.com. This is just my favorite part of the internet. Access prohibited. This is a private web. You are being rerouted to the public information site. Oh, I love it. <laughs> now, that's obviously just a uh. random dialogue prompt thing programmed to come up. And the, private, the, the public information site is just Google. But when this happened to me as a teenager, I believed it. So you can read up on all the lore on Wikipedia, but the TLDR is that Hell.com was an intentionally mysterious website that existed from 1995 to 2009. And I wanted to recreate that mystery on the modern web. There were too many Easter eggs, too many things to share, but I used a combination of the pages and user journeys described on Wikipedia and the ones I found on the Wayback Machine to recreate it. I'm just randomly clicking around, even like I don't know 
where to click to get what I want. Um, but it's built with Astro and jQuery. jQuery, because I wanted to preserve the nostalgia of an earlier web, even though it's still the most popular JavaScript library used on the web today. But it was a little tricky to get jQuery working in Astro, so I wrote about it on my blog. If you like to blog or if you're just thinking about it, the best things you can write about are the things that were difficult and the problems you solved. The chances are someone else has experienced this too, and you can help people and also yourself when you forget how to do something. And if I have one more closing piece of advice for you, is to ship your silly side projects. Have fun, like this stupid piece of website. It just tells you whether I'm live on Twitch or not. It takes more inspiration from GeoCities. It plays with CSS. The fake marquee makes another appearance. It's nonsense, but I learned a lot from making it because silly things stick. I remember vividly in primary school when we were learning about the effects of alcohol. And instead of just standing at the front of the class and telling us how dangerous alcohol was, our teacher spent the lesson wobbling around the classroom, slurring his speech, and generally being silly, making us laugh. But we learned. And I've never forgotten this lesson, and I've always drawn on this approach for inspiration when I was a music teacher. And it's one of the core driving principles of entertainment as code. I'm Salma. I write code for your entertainment. Find me on the internet everywhere as White Panther. And I'll see you on Twitch. It's chaos over here.